So welcome everyone. We're, uh, we're going to kick off, um, as most of you know, we run a, a, a group program where we run education seminars and webinars uh, every month for our clients. Um, whether you're a group client or a one-on-one -on -one client, uh, everyone's uh, free to attend. We've, uh, we've actually invited some guests along today as well. I think Vivian um, reached out to her clients and, uh, and you know, just to find out whether they uh, would like to attend the webinar. So, so this is uh, this month's webinar. We're doing a little bit different this time. We've got a guest presenter along. So I'll just bring up Vivian's, uh, Vivian's details and picture there. So just want to check firstly, can everyone uh, see the screen share? If you can just uh, let us know through chat that you can see the screen share, that'd be great. And I'll just take you through Vivian's bio. Great. So uh, Vivian's a partner at uh, Hammond UM Turnbull, a, uh, a Parramatta-based law firm, um, which is a medium-sized firm. It's, uh, it, uh, Vivian can probably tell us a bit more about it in a minute, but, uh, but the firm has a wide range of disciplines across commercial law, family law, wills, testamentary uh, issues, um, criminal law, so a whole range of things. Uh, Vivian's area of specialty is commercial law, um, and... She's also had uh, roles in the past at uh, insolvency firms, in particular Corda Mentha, which uh, is one of the premier um, insolvency firms in Australia, handles some very large uh, cases. So, um, so Vivian will be presenting today on credit management, um, on credit processes within the business, but also the whole uh, escalation process, the debt recovery process, what the options are. Uh, plus, there's probably a few uh, specific issues that you may or may not be aware of um, in terms of some recent legislation and changes uh, in the last couple of years that uh, that a few of you may um, may be relevant. It may be relevant for a few of you. Okay, so so that's the outline. So the outline is I'm going to hand over to Vivian in a minute. Um, she'll share her screen and she has a presentation that she wants to share with us. Uh, we will be opening it up and, uh, and getting some interaction and asking you questions during the, uh, the presentation uh, and then unmuting people um, who have some questions that we can talk more specifically about your particular situation, uh, issues that you've had with, with customers that you're currently having. You know, really want to make this a interactive uh, and, and a presentation that's not, not too much, there's not too many slides, it's more around discussing issues and opening it up for discussion amongst the group. Um, and then uh, obviously we'll, uh, we'll leave more time for Q&A at the end. Okay, so uh, Vivian, I'm just gonna stop my screen share and I'll let you um, share your screen and your presentation. Um, there you go. Can everyone see that? Yes. All right, so, so yeah, over to you, Vivian. Do you want to just introduce yourself quickly? I mean, I did a very, very quick bio, but uh, yeah, you can probably elaborate more on, 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 the, on the work that you do um, and, and possibly also where a lawyer fits in rather than maybe a debt collector um, or, sorry, a, you know, a debt collection agency. Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay, morning, everyone. Um, Vivian Nguyen from HNC Legal. Um, I'm a partner here, as, as uh, Anil has said. I haven't done a webinar in front of nobody before. <laughs> Usually I do presentations in front of people and gauge the room, so it's a bit strange talking to my screen. Um, so bear with me today. Um, funnily enough, Cortamenta, if no one knows the most... Um, Highlighted case would be ANSET. So if everyone remembered ANSET, quarter mental were the administrations on ANSET and that ran for 20 years. Oh, wow. So, um, okay, so cash flow problems, uh, we're doing credit management today. Why a lawyer and not a debt recovery agent? Look, we work closely with debt recovery agents anyway, and if they're not successful at the end of the day, um, they call us and, and we sort it out on the legal side. So we know their processes, we know what they go through. Um, so either or is fine, really. Um, does that answer the question, Anil? 
Yeah, I think it's uh, generally speaking, a lot of our clients probably would engage with a, um, a, a debt collection agency either to set up the terms and conditions. I know you're going to cover that, um, yeah. but obviously a lawyer can do that as well um, and, and possibly do it in a more customized way. Um, but then, but then they'll probably, you know, it'll be good to discuss the process where a debt collection agency might, uh, be used initially. And then at what stage they would get, you know, a client would look to get a, get a solicitor involved, or they may, you know, decide to, uh, to do a lot themselves and then maybe use a solicitor straight away. So it's just trying to look at those sorts of options and you'll probably cover that as part of the, the your, your presentation anyway. Um, yeah, and if so, there are any questions from anybody else in terms of their experience and what they've used, um, feel free to put it in the chat box and I'll answer it as we go along. Great. Okay. I'll leave it with you. Go, go for it, Vivian. No worries. Okay, so um, all businesses experience cash flow problems at some time. Um, I can say we have. <laughs> um, so we have to remember that age-old saying, that cash is king. Managing cash flow is an important aspect of any business. Um, a statistic there is 90% of small business failure is caused by poor cash flow problems. So what are the main causes of cash flow issues? Usually they're over trading or expanding quickly, businesses over borrowing, there's a lack of planning, overstocking, unforeseen changes, or poor credit control and predator arrears. That's why we've got this topic here today. I see a lot of businesses who don't focus on the creditor arrears and the credit control. Um, I've seen it from the beginning where we help them with debt recovery matters, but I've also seen businesses go out of business and go into liquidation as a result. Other issues that you may go through through the poor credit control are you may go through the litigation process, you may lose customers, you may have to be put into a position where you have to decide to continue to throw good money after bad money or cut the relationship entirely. Most businesses that I help, they fear driving the customers away. So as a result, they don't chase their credit or they don't have a business credit control around their credit. Customers want credit so they can have a cash flow on their side of things, but you as a business owner need to have cash flow on your side of the business. So there needs to be a healthy balance either way. So everyone put in the chat box, what issues have they experienced with their own credit management? Have they been in that position where you've had to make that difficult call in relation to um, a client and having to either cut them or continue to massage that relationship and try to get some money out of them because you've got bills that you have to pay. Yeah, and no, I think that's great, Vivian. I think uh, you're right. It'd be great to hear what challenges people have had, either had in the past or are having currently, uh, or just in general, any other questions that you might want um, or any anything that you'd like to be uh, covered in this presentation um, that you have questions about and we'll make sure that if it's not covered in Vivian's, you know, the, the main part of her presentation, we can definitely open that up and have a discussion at the end. So um, as Vivian said, open up your chat box and just let us know and I'll read out uh, read out the responses as we get them. Thanks, Will. <laughs> so um, I'm happy to facilitate Vivian. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so Will's got here, yes, a constant task, uh, just trying to keep the balance of a happy customer but keeping cash flow healthy for, for yourself, right? Um, Nick said here, I've had a client who's very slow in paying his bills. He now wants extra work done and we are reluctant to do any further work for them. Okay, so we might uh, get a bit more information there, Nick. Um, actually, while we're waiting for other people to, to enter into that... Um, Enter some issues. Sorry, that's Lauren. Very good. Um, I might just unmute you quickly, uh, Lauren, just to uh, just to get a bit more information because it's probably something. It's in. It's a scenario that a lot of uh, 
businesses will come across where you know you want to take you you, you want to do more work um, you might even want to help the customer because they need things done um, but at the same time you know their track record hasn't been hasn't been the best so um, let me just find Lauren are you there I am how are you hopefully you don't have any uh, any uh, noisy kids in the background oh, I do she's quiet at the moment so. <laughs> So yeah, maybe so just, um, sorry, go. <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> no, she's saying hi. Hi. What's that? I thought she was going to explain to us what the problem oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh well she's she knows all about everything. She's a part of it all. Um yeah, we just had a, a client um <clears throat> it wasn't an overly large job, but you know, did the work for them kind of went above and beyond, sort of kept going back to sort of troubleshoot things for them and essentially they just wouldn't pay their bill and you kind of just get to the point where it's like, well, you can just write it off. Mm -hmm. um, they did pay in the end but then it's like, you know, the hassle to continue to come back and do more work for them. It's like, mm, it's, it's just not, uh, you sort of feel like it's not really worth the effort at the end of the day. And the yeah. and the risk and the risk as well probably, uh, just yeah. just to give everyone that that background that uh, Lauren uh, and her husband Nick uh, run a, a landscaping construction, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, yeah, it's just kind of it sort of just puts that like a you know we're busy enough anyway we don't necessarily need to chase that work but yeah he was a bloody lawyer too exactly Nick. <laughs> I just um, <laughs> <laughs> and that's the thing like. You know, it wasn't a huge contract. Um, he never sort of, uh, I suppose, said to us that it was any issues paying the bill. And he, he always seemed happy with the work. So we were just not really sure why it took so long for him to actually fix the bill up. And, yeah, to do any further work means, you know, you're sort of risking then uh, affecting your cash flow for that, for that job. So. Yeah. Of course. I think the difficult thing that I see with a lot of clients is that, People find it difficult to talk about money. That, yeah. That's always been what I found is the difficulty. Um, they don't like to ask about the bill or they don't like to um, tell them how much it's going to be or they don't like to have that conversation where, look, enough's enough. We need to draw a line and we can't, we would love to help you and we would want to come out, but we can't continue to come out unless you pay your outstanding bill. Yeah. Um, and it has to be that blunt for some people and yeah. it's it's more about gauging at what point do you make that call and say look enough's enough this is what we need to do and having that system and process in place and that may be after you know let's say your trading terms are two weeks that may be after you send a reminder notice prior to it being actually overdue then it is overdue and you send an overdue notice um, and then you might send a letter of demand or you might pick up the phone and give them a call about it. And if after all of that, they still not, they still haven't paid, you, you'd have to cut the cord and say, look, this is where we're at. We can't keep coming out to see you or we can't keep doing work for you. You need to pay your arrears to date and then we can continue on with the relationship. All right. So, so Lauren, I might... I was just going to say, like, even, like, Programs like Zero actually automatically send reminders to yeah. to your clients, uh, which is helpful. Um, yeah. But then, yeah, when you've <clears throat> already spoken to them about the bill, they keep saying, you know, yeah, 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 not a problem. I'll fix it up tonight, and then it's just nothing, nothing, nothing. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so, what are you so, supposed to do? Yeah. So, Lauren, I might just uh, just put you back on the mute because I know that uh, Vivian's going to cover off the whole the credit management process, and she's already started talking about that. Um, but yeah, at this stage, let's just get a feel for some of the issues that people have, and then we can. Uh, once once Vivian's gone through the the presentation, and if there's still issues or questions that people have, then uh, then we can we can cover it off. Good. Um, so Karen's also said here in a chat box, um, she finds that building a relationship with the accounts department is pivotal to finding out where our payment is in the company system. So so Karen and her husband run a. Um, a town planning business, uh, do a lot of work for councils and large developers. So, uh, and those large organisations, you're right, it's not just the, um, 
you know, the, the customer you're dealing with that, that makes the decisions or, or pays the bills, there's a whole process and departments within the, an organisation that you need to build relationships with. So that's a good point. Um, any quick uh, comments there, Vivian, around that? No, that, that is a good point, Karen. Um, obviously, it depends on who your creditor is and we'll go through knowing who your creditor is, who it is that owes you money. And especially with the bigger creditors who have an accounts department, it is important to maintain that relationship and understand exactly what um, red tape they need to go through to get paid. All right, very good. Um, might you let you get on with the uh, presentation, Vivian? Sure. So um, I've put here five keys to good credit management. This is what you need to have. We're, all, we're not all perfect. So this in a perfect world, you'd have all five of these things um, and you should get them checked regularly and keep them updated. So I'll go through each of them in detail. The first is your terms and conditions. This is important. Um, this is your contract with your customers. It's there to reduce the disputes or issues that customers may face and it also specifies when the debt is actually due. Now, um, Anil raised that you may do your terms and conditions with debt recovery agencies or you may do them with lawyers or you may do them yourself. Um, as a lawyer, my position on this is that if you want the right terms and conditions, you should see a lawyer about it. The reason being is because usually we're up to date with what's going on in the marketplace, um, what needs to be in those agreements, and we come from it from a standpoint of either chasing that debt or you on the terms and conditions at the end when it does become difficult or um, any contractual disputes um, between you and your customer. So we look at the terms and conditions from that angle and not, particularly you may not look at it from that angle when you're doing it yourself and or debt recovery agents may not look at it from that angle as well. Now your terms and conditions should on a basic level cover your price, the terms of payments, any warranties, and conditions of the purchase of any goods or services that you sell. But in terms of credit management, it needs to have certain things. The first is if you do sell goods, um, that your ownership of those goods remains with you until a payment is made. That's important because um, for those that supply goods, you can go in and take the goods if they don't make payments. I know that's not always reality, especially in the building industry when you might have built a set of stairs, you're not going to go and pull it out because you can't really do much with it, except maybe chuck it on the fire. <laughs> um, but it's still important to know that you can, if push came to shove, that you could go there and take the staircase out. Yeah, okay. So, so if... Uh... If a, you know, I've got a kitchen client, for example, uh, they, they build and install kitchens. Uh, so if someone doesn't pay, uh, then they can possibly go in and, and rip out the kitchen. Correct. Yeah. Correct. And, and in those cases where they've part paid, so a lot of, um, uh, especially in the residential market, they, they have progress payments. In commercial, it's different. It's probably more back-ended, the payments. Um, where they have made part payment, it's probably... Tricky to, to yeah, yeah. yeah. Anyway. Um, oh, look, the terms and conditions are written in a way where, um, unless the payment is made in full, the mm -hmm. um, goods are still owned by, yeah, okay, great manufacturer. Yeah. So, yes, Nick, it would be trespassing, but realistically, if it's still an open site, sometimes you can you, you may still have access to the site and you could go get it. Just depends. But yep. it's that extra layer that you could have in terms of enforcing that outstanding invoice. You could say to them, I still own those goods. I can come in and go and get it. And we could get a court order, for example, for you to go and get that so that it wouldn't be trespassed. But if you don't have that, you don't have that avenue. Yeah. 
Good. Um, the other thing that you would have in your terms and conditions would be a clause regarding PPSA and retention of title. Now that allows you to put a security over the goods. So similar to saying that you still own the goods, it's that extra level um, in the event a few things occur. Most of the time it's it's more to protect you when the business goes into or the customer, sorry, goes into liquidation. That happens a lot in the building game. You get the builders go into liquidation and leave all their subcontractors um, with their outstanding invoices. Um, if you don't have that PPSA clause in your terms and conditions and you don't have a retention of title and you haven't put a security over your goods, bear in mind that there's a few things that you have to do before you can do all of those three things. But if you don't have that and the company does or business goes into liquidation, the liquidator turns up on the day and unless there's a security over the goods, he owns everything. Yep. So, so I've got a, um, a, a, a worked with a client in the past. They uh, install elevators, and so, so they might deliver that elevator to site. Um, hasn't been fully paid for, um, and they definitely needed to use this the PPSA. So, a PPSA stands for is it Personal Property Securities Security Act. Act. Yeah, uh, and there's also a PPSR, which is the register. So, you need to register those goods. So, as Vivian said, if uh, if, if that company goes into liquidation, the liquidator gets appointed or administrator, they, they basically get ownership over that. But if it's registered, then it stays with, with the, the supplier. Yeah. Yes, yes. So yeah. the liquidator can't take that elevator and go sell it and pay off the secure creditor. Um, that obviously the supplier can come in and, and take those goods back. Yeah. Now, Karen's just asked a question here. You know, how does it work if you're providing a service and not a product? Obviously, the PPSA doesn't apply, but but otherwise, in terms of, yeah, you can't really take back a service once it's provided, no. potentially. Um, <laughs> no, that's correct. And, um, yeah, look, that only applies to, obviously, things that we can register interests on and services is not one of them. Now, um, and, and the ownership that I've already talked about doesn't apply to services. So the next can I ask, thing... Can, can I ask on that, sorry, Vivian? Um, in, in Karen's case, they provide a report um, to the developer, for example, that the developer may use for uh, development application purposes. Um, if, if they haven't paid for that and there's a dispute, could they withhold the right to, for the developer to use that report? Um, it, it depends on their terms and conditions. It also depends on where, and I can see Karen said yes, we do that now. It also depends on where it is in the process, I'd imagine, because if they've put it in for DA, it's going to be very hard for you to take yeah. that all back. All right, good. We better move on, but that's, yeah, good. But yeah, keep, keep uh, as, as Vivian's uh, talking through things, yeah, feel free to, uh, yeah, to send through your questions through the chat box. That'd be great. Um, so the next thing you need in your terms and conditions is a capable interest. So what that is, is it's a clause in the um, terms and conditions that says that you, that as a result of um, your customer not paying their bill, that, that they provide you a capable interest which allows you to place a credit on the property. Now you may have gone through an experience where you've chased debt and you know that your customer has, you know, they live in this million, multi-million dollar property and you want a piece of that property and your lawyer turns around and says, well, you don't have a capital interest. Um, or you lodge a caveat anyway, and they overturn that, and, or they file a lapse notice, and your lawyer says to you, yeah, you'll have to withdraw your caveat because you don't have a capital interest. It's going to cost you a whole lot of money to buy this in the same spot. Um, if you have that in your terms and conditions, it strengthens the case of you having a capital interest. So this is important for people who are providing services and not a product because that's that extra level of security that you can have. Um, the other clause that you should have in your terms and conditions is your ability to charge costs of chasing debt. 
So, um, you know, you ha might have a debt outstanding of $50,000 and it may cost you, say, $5,000, $10,000 to chase that debt. Um, you want to be able to put that cost on to the customer at the end of the day if they're not willing to pay. Um, it's good to have terms and conditions. Um, but they obviously need to be signed and put in front of the customer or at least told to the customer about it. So just make sure that that is the case. Um, a question out there for everyone. When was the last time everyone had their terms and conditions review? Do they know if they have these terms that I've outlined to you in your terms and conditions? Yeah, no, but you're right. It'd be good to hear back. If you can just type in your chat box whether whether that's an area that you probably need to tighten up or review. Um, while while they're doing that, Vivian, um, uh, I've seen some terms and conditions from um, you know other credit credit agencies that can be quite lengthy. Um, yeah. What are your thoughts about that? It, it, is it it is necessary in some cases or or if it was done in a more customised way through a solicitor that, that you could actually make it less cumbersome? It depends on the business. Um, I've had clients that go, look, I want it to fit in one page because my, my customers aren't going to read that and they're not going to want to go through a five-page document of terms and conditions. Um, for me, the answer to that is it really depends on the business and what it is that they do. Um, a, usually a typical business that's um, selling goods and services on a once-off occasion, you could fit terms and conditions to maybe a page to a double-sided page mm -hmm. um, just to give you an understanding. But it, it just really depends. We customise our terms and conditions for all of our clients to make sure that they have what it is that they need. Yeah. All right, good. And once, obviously, there's a bit of an investment up front to do that, but at least then, you know, they've got it for their whole trading, like for the, you know, for all the time the business is going to be in operation, apart from obviously having to update it as as uh, legislation might change and so on, or the, or the business or the business may change in the sorts of services and products or customers that, it, it has changes. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and for us, like if, if legislation changes, we um, send it out to our clients to let them know that there has been this change, and happy to um, assist them in inserting that particular clause into their terms and conditions. And we're always happy to have a chat with our clients if their business has changed to make sure that those terms and conditions haven't, yeah. I guess, um, been outdated as a result. Yeah. Now, Will's, Will said here in the chat box, it's probably been five years or more, so I probably need to have a look at that. Uh, now, Lee's asked a question here. That, well, he needs to probably needs to review his, uh, but what's the best method when emailing invoices? So it's not at the invoicing stage, is it? It's more when the when the, uh, the right. services have been agreed to. Yeah. Don't. Yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, it's not at the invoicing stage. It's, it's when you put out that quotation, or when you've told them how much it's going to cost at that stage. So, you know, a lot of billing clients, they'll render a quotation. Um, that quotation has at the bottom of it um, either refer to our website for terms and conditions. And if you, if you sign or accept this quotation, you accept our terms and conditions as per our website or as per the back of this quotation, yep. Yep. whatever it may be. Okay. And if um, someone just emails back I, and acceptance? Yes. Yeah. Yes, that's fine. Or if they go ahead and um, you know render a purchase order, that's fine. That's mm -hmm. acceptance. Yep. Um, just on will that five years. I'm concerned about that PPSA. You might not have it in your in your. Yeah. So Will's business, um, uh, they yeah, import. Yeah, Will's business, so import and distribute products uh, to retail outlets um, predominantly. So, so yeah, there could be a, it's, it's, and, they're, and they're individual, like individually each item small, you know, the orders are small, so it may not warrant. It may not. Yeah. 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 It may change. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, no, it definitely needs to be reviewed. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Okay. Um, moving on. Yep, yep. 
So number two is um, once you've got that base down with your terms and conditions, um, you have a usually your credit management relates to clients that are on credit um, most of the time. So you want to know who your creditor is. These are the guys that you give um, credit to. So you want to do a credit check. And um, I put a few websites on there because I'll go through and tell you exactly what the steps should be. Um, you want to make sure that you, you should have a credit application provided to them. Now, make sure that credit application is filled out. All of it, not half of it. I've received a lot of credit applications after I've had to chase a debt and only half of it is filled out. It might just be the person's name, their ACN or ABN isn't there. You know, make sure all of that information is filled out. And if they don't want to fill it out, sit down with them and fill it out with them or insist that they do fill it out. Um, it's important at that time to do so because if they don't pay you, um, that lack of information is going to cause a lot of difficulties for you and for us or a debt collection agency to chase them. Um, so like I said, collect the ACN, the ABN, the physical place of their business and all other contact information. So it may be their residential address if you're dealing with the director of the company. It may be their email and phone number. So as much information as you possibly can get. Um, a copy of ID. So if you're giving credit to a person, not a, not a company, so a sole trader, get a copy of their driver's license and keep that with your credit application. If you're doing business with a company, get a copy of the driver's license of the director that you're doing business with. Now also you want to make sure that the person, especially if we're talking about a company, you want to make sure that the person you're dealing with has the ability to accept the terms and conditions. What I mean by that is really with the company, the only people that are able to accept terms and conditions are directors. Um, obviously that can be given to other staff members if we're, if we're dealing with um, companies of bigger sizes and that might be relevant for Karen. Um, but we want to just make sure that they have that authority to sign off on the application and all of the um, terms and conditions. So how do we do that? Um, how do we make sure we have all of the right information? Once we get that ACN or ABN, you want to check if the business exists. So the first thing is do an ABN search. So that can be done for any client, whether it's a sole trader, a partnership or a company. So the first website that I've got there on the slide show is um, the free ABN search. So you can go there and put in their name or their ABN or ACN and you'll get spit out a result that will tell you whether or not they actually exist. Now, if it doesn't show up with a the result, then don't do business with that person <laughs> or maybe double check that you got the right information. The next thing um, that you need to do if it is a company that you're dealing with because you need to do a company search. That company search will tell you if they're in existence, if they're a registered company and they're not in any kind of administration. Um, and it will also tell you who the directors are. So it'll, it will confirm for you that you're dealing with the right person. Now that in itself, I've put the, the second website there is the asset website where you can do that search. It costs about, I think, $11 on ASIC. Um, and, and you can just go through that on your own. And then um, the third thing you want to do is a credit check. Um, that is through, you can either do it through Equifax, which I've put there as a website, or you can do it through Dun & Bad Street. Equifax, it costs about $20. Um, Dun & Brad Street is quite, expensive, I think it's like 50 or 70 dollars, but it just depends on the size of the business and how much information you want to get. The Equifax credit check is, is good. Um, it gives you enough information. It just tells you if they've ever been in any credit difficulty or any issues or if they've got any um, black marks against their name on their credit. Um, and then once you've done all of that and you're satisfied with your searches, um, you can approve their credit and 
obviously set a credit limit in the terms of when they would make pay. Okay, great. Excellent, Vivian. Um, now, just uh, just wanted to ask about that, getting the driver's licence copy. I thought, you know, I'm thinking that could be difficult or uh, I'm just curious uh, if, if I could open that up to people um, on the call. Has anyone gone through that process? Is it something that they've been aware of? Uh, so what's the, what's the need for that, Vivian, just to clarify? Um, it's just extra information that you get. Um, I find it quite effective when we have to chase a debt, especially if um, the director's left or um, can't be found and we need to contact them. Um, it gets that information in terms of where their um, residential address is. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, it's just good information. It also confirms that you saw the person, you know who they are, they signed the application and it wasn't just a rogue person who's gone, oh, it wasn't me. Mm -hmm. I've, I've, been, I've been at the end of the debt recovery matter where the uh, director said, oh, I didn't sign that. Yep. Okay. So Good. it's just that level, like, look, it's not the be all or end all if you don't get a copy of the ID, but in a perfect world, if you could, um, it's just that extra information in the event that you have to go all the way down the path of yeah. All right, good. Now, Karen's also asked a question here. Um, we have a standard emails for small services and we ask the client to sign the acceptance and return before we start. Some clients simply reply and say, thanks, go ahead. Is this considered acceptance of the terms of the email we have sent? And I think we discussed this, that that is acceptance. It is acceptance. Look, obviously, Having a signed acceptance is better than having an email, is better than having no email but a purchase order. So it's just a different levels of acceptance, um, but it's still acceptance in the view of the court. Okay. Good. So I guess um, my question on the credit check is really for everyone. Um, when was the last time you reviewed your credit application? Does that credit application ask for all of the information that I've just listed out there? Um, and what is your credit application process? Are you collecting all of this information? Are you checking if this business exists? Are you doing those company searches or credit searches? Um, the other thing I've actually missed, sorry, is that your credit application should also insist on trade refer referees. So it's good to just get from your um, customer to other trade referees that they're doing credit with um, and then and then call them up. It's like employing someone and asking for a referee and asking how they went. Um, it's the same thing. Yep. Very good. Okay. Any questions on that? Yeah, but Keep going and we'll see if, if questions do come through. Okay. Yep. No problems. So um, the third thing is get security. What does that mean? Um, for companies, if, you, if your customers are companies, you want personal guarantees from the director and those gar personal guarantees should be attached to your credit application or built into your credit application. Um, if it's... Look, it, it depends on the work that you're doing. Obviously, I'm talking if, if it's large jobs, you may want to get an asset and um, register some kind of security on there. So whether that be a mortgage or a caveat or anything like that on sizable jobs that you're just unsure after you've done all of the credit checks. Um, and obviously, register that uh, PPSR registration security um, that we discussed in point one above. Okay, good. And um, yeah, I'd be curious uh, what people's experience have been uh, asking for a director's guarantee. So maybe while, while uh, Vivian's continue to go through her presentation, just feel free to uh, yeah, just share what your experience has been in your chat box and we can maybe open up that discussion. Yeah. Look, a director's guarantee is quite important. We currently have a debt that we're chasing for our clients, and that company has gone into liquidation. Um, 
but he got a director guarantee, director personal guarantee. Mm-hmm. And um, so we're now chasing that director personally. So I've, I've said to the client, let go the company because there's no point throwing any more money into that. It's now gone into liquidation. Mm-hmm. Um, but we can chase the director personally. And that director has personal assets in his name. Sometimes they don't. Um, and that's why it's important. You don't have to get a guarantee from the director. You can get a guarantee from his wife who doesn't have all of the um, assets in her name. So it, it's just important to, to think about that. Yeah. Okay, number four. So have a system and stick to it. So we, you need a credit management system. So I think, who was it? Lauren was saying that obviously with, with zero, zero sends out the notices and reminders without any prompting. So a system like that is good to have. So you want to make sure that you have a system where you're sending out the invoices promptly. You send those reminder notices promptly, reminder notices before the money is due, um, and that your system is aware or whatever it might be is aware that there is a credit limit and what the terms of payment is so that you don't go over that credit limit. Once that due date has passed, you want to have a system that makes sure that you pursue the debt. You want to strike while the iron is hot. So you want to get a mechanism in place that um, alerts you when that invoice is due. Um, That could be an accounting software like Xero, that could just be you just checking weekly or whatever it might be, your outstanding invoices, including someone in to chase them. Um, and then what you need to do is send, chase, emails, letters, phone calls, and um, obviously a letter of demand if it gets to that. But in the next slide, we'll talk about escalating bad debtors and what we should do. Okay, good. I think the important thing there that you mentioned, Vivian, is really sticking to it because, you know, people, you know, they, they let things go. They don't follow up debtors up past their due date. They don't obviously, you know, a lot of people don't send a reminder prior to the due date or even, you know, when the due dates um, come. So it's really about just having... Yeah, getting onto things sooner rather than later, and the, the longer you later, the longer you leave it, then the customer probably thinks, "Oh, we haven't chased it for a, for for a month." You know, I can take my time. They're not that. Correct. Yeah. Yeah, you just need to be on top of it. Yeah. Um, and and strike while the iron is hot, mm-hmm. basically. Yeah. Good. Um. Any questions? So, any questions there from anyone around that whole the process? Uh, obviously, getting the terms and conditions done up front, you know, doing the credit check, having a good process for that, uh, including getting some security, the director's guarantee, and then making sure that you firstly invoice on time. <laughs> that's that's obviously always a uh, a good step to to having good cash flow is actually sending the invoices on time. But then, obviously, tracking when they're due having a, a reminder process, a um, some sort of a, an escalation process or overdue process prior to the letter of demand and then obviously having... You're going to cover the letter of demand process yeah. next? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, so the last thing um, that you should have after all of that is if you've exhausted all of your chasing abilities... Um, and you have no luck or no success, then, or you hear all of those excuses, uh, I'd like to see what other people have heard, but what I've heard is, I'll pay you next week, I've had some cash flow problems, the check's in the post, I can't pay you until John pays me, or you don't hear anything at all. You need to start calling in your reinforcements and cut the cord and say enough is enough. Um, And that could be your debt collectors or your lawyers. Uh, My advice is that with debt collectors, you want to bring them in for your simple debts and your small debts um, because commercially that's worth it. And then lawyers for your more complex and larger debts. 
Um, so when I say complex, it would generally mean they've raised an issue with the product or services that have been provided. But also be aware of when they raise a dispute with it, is it a genuine dispute? Are they raising it because it actually exists or are they raising it because they want to buy more time to pay you? And, and um, in, in terms of raising an issue, I think in the T's and C's as well, you can stipulate when they need to be able, when they need, how long they have before they raise an yeah. issue. Yeah. That's correct. That's correct. Yeah. yeah. And, and a process of how to raise that issue. You can put in your terms and conditions. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Um, yeah, generally you can have something like they, you know, they have five days to raise an issue or 10 days to raise an issue. Mm -hmm. That issue has to be raised in writing. Um, if it can't be resolved, two people from uh, a person from each of the businesses that have the ability to make decisions who sit down and have a meeting and have a discussion about the issue and try to resolve it. So yep. there's also dispute resolution process that should be in the technical conditions as well. Mm -hmm. um, and so if a debt collector isn't successful, obviously the legal um, enforcement options are the letter of demand, the statement of claim, which comes out with a garnishing, a writ, an examination, or potentially liquidation or bankruptcy, um, and a statutory demand for company. But you need to escalate it if it's not working. Um, because otherwise there's no point being in business if you're not getting paid for it. Any questions on that? I'd love to, I'm sure people have had issues, you know, in the past or, you know, or, or they've, they've heard of friends or others in business that have had issues getting that collection. So I think one, one thing that I've heard um, is that, oh, it's too expensive to chase the debt. Um, it, you know, it's too expensive to appoint either a debt collection agency or a solicitor. Uh, but there are, I suppose it's understanding what the steps are prior to that, whether, you know, letter of demand is not a... Um, you know, it's probably a fairly straightforward process uh, that probably doesn't cost too much and is probably enough to get people to, you know, look at you seriously. Um, yeah. And what are the, so is that, that would obviously be the first step? Yeah. Um, why don't we go to escalating bad areas okay. and that will right. force all the steps, I think. Yeah. Okay. So, Escalating bad debtors. So the first step from your end, the first step should be send that friendly re reminder before it's due. Set, then um, if it is overdue, send an overdue payment reminder. If it remains overdue, then you want to try to make direct contact with the person because obviously to keep that relationship going with the customer, you don't want to just assume the worst, that they're not wanting to pay you. Um, so when I say make direct contact, pick up the phone, give them a call and see how they're going. Usually at that point, you'll know whether they're going to pay you or not um, because it depends on the excuse. Um, once you've made that direct contact, you could make, a choice here. You could either stop the work or send a letter of demand from your own business. And what I mean by letter of demand, it's just literally this payment is overdue. If you don't pay it within, say, five business days or a week, um, we will send it off to a debt collection agency or a lawyer. So that's the letter of demand that you can send yourself. And you definitely at that point want to stop any work that you're doing. And then if that all of that fails and it's not successful, then you want to consider that debt collection agency or a lawyer for that further enforcement action you were talking about. And that may just be, let's say for example, a debt collection agency, they'll pick up the phone and have pretty much hounds them to pay you and use their skills to do so. Um, if that's not successful, they may escalate it to a letter of demand from a lawyer and then if that's not successful, it'll go through either the process of doing a statement of claim or a statutory demand. 
Okay, good. So, so with the when when appointing a uh, a debt collection agency, I know some charge a you know a percentage of the debt collected. Um, is that what's in terms of selecting a, a debt collection agency for those smaller debts that that probably don't warrant going to a solicitor at that stage? Do you think it's just would it be are there, are there collection agencies that just charge a fee for making that initial phone call, for example? Um, what's been your experience with how debt collection agencies work and, and the types of options that, that businesses might have? Yeah. You there, Vivian? Can I, can I just get everyone to just enter something into the chat box just to make sure that everyone can still hear us because we haven't had any, uh, uh, there we go. Yep, everyone can hear, good stuff. Yep, my experience with debt collection agents, they are tentatively listening. <laughs> <laughs> good. Thanks, I'm glad everyone's still around. <laughs> and I'm bored everybody. Um, yeah, sorry. Um, like my experience with debt collection agencies is that they charge you a percentage of the debt, but they only charge that on success. Yep. And they don't charge you for that initial phone call because one phone calls, you've already made the, tried to make the contact. By the time you get to a debt collection agency, that first phone call is probably not going to go anywhere. They need to do a few phone calls before they um, can, can crack the customer. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, there's a few agencies out there who will either call from their own business and say I'm so and so from debt collection agency or they'll work with you to call from your business. So they can go, I'm you know Vivian Newen from let's say H and well, if they were calling from my business, H and T legal, just calling about the debt. Because I find that some people are a bit Concerned about sending it to a debt collection agency, especially if there is a pre existing relationship with that particular customer or that customer yep. has good referrals. Yep. So, there are some debt collection agencies out there that are happy to be at your office and call from your phone number and send emails from, from your account's email. So, it looks yep. like it's an internal debt collection chasing. Yep. But they've obviously had experience in the field to determine whether or not that person is going to pay um, and also determine um, the right ways to get them to pay. Yep. Okay, so they can, so if you're not confident chasing that debt and you obviously don't have the same sort of experience as they do, they can, uh, they can come in, go through your debtors and, and make those calls um, and, and, and assess which ones yeah. And then I suppose manage that process because some people will, well, they'll probably insist on some t sort of time frame, and then uh, if that time frame hasn't been hit, then at least they can they can track the progress of those, you know, those debts and yep. the conversation. Yep. Okay. Yeah. All right. Good. Nick sent through a comment. Yes, so Nick's, uh, yeah, Nick's using a, 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 a debt collection and credit management agency and he says that they will recoup those costs within the collection process at no cost to them, which is what you, which is what you uh, shared in your point about yeah. terms and conditions, Vivian, that those debt collection costs need to be written into the terms and conditions as recoverable yeah. Yeah, from the customer. That's yeah. Um, yeah. So, Good. So, um, any questions uh, for Vivian in in uh, in relation to your specific situation? Um, in relation to yeah, anything that you've come across that you might want some uh, some free advice on as Vivian is with us. <laughs> so, Vivian, that's your you finish your presentation. Yeah. Yep, I might just uh, get you to stop your share and I'll just reshare mine. Sure. Yeah. So questions. Looks like everyone's uh, question free, Vivian. Oh. I mean,
mean, we've had plenty of time for questions and discussion uh, throughout the presentation, which is great. So I guess from now on, um, we're happy to provide an hour free to all webinar participants <laughs> where we can either review your T's and C's and, the credit, and your credit application based on credit management and advise if they should be updated or look at any of your current outstanding debt and let you know our opinion on either using a debt collection agency or legal enforcement. Yep. All right, so you've got a service there just to review things in the first place and then yep. prior to them committing to obviously uh, um, yeah, having to get their T's and C's you know, updated. Yeah. Yeah, all right, great. Excellent. So what I'd like everyone to do um, um, next... Uh, sorry, yeah, go ahead, uh, Shen. Uh, Karen has a question. Oh, okay, great. Um. So we do work for contractors on behalf of clients. Who do we chase for the debt if the contractor says go ahead and we only have the client's name? Okay, so we do work for contractors on behalf of clients. I might just unmute Karen quickly just to, just to elaborate a little bit. Hi, Karen, can you, uh, can you hear us there? Uh, yes, I can. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, um, we have a lot of consultants that might want some general advice and it's three to five hours it's not a lot of time mm -hmm. um, and they'll say look here's all the documentation here's all the plans etc uh, the client's name is Joe Bloggs and we need to find out what we can do and right. then like so the contractors engaging us and we send our little email off for them to sign usually they flip back saying yes go ahead but then when the debt's not paid and I've been talking to the contractor and saying, so pay it, you know, you've chased your client to get paid, uh, who can I actually send the letter of demand to? I guess because he, yeah, sorry, yeah, he's saying that the, the client should be paying and we're going, well, you engaged us. Yeah. I, I guess the question goes down to do your ultimate in the work for. So if the contractor has engaged you, then your T's and C's need to be signed or accepted by the contractor. Yep. If the client that's going to pay you, that needs to be signed and accepted by the client. So it depends on where the process is to you. Um, so in my, sorry. So we really we should be chasing a contractor because um, he's told us the uh, client's name, but he's not given us any client details. Yeah. I think what Vivian's saying is that if you're going to invoice the client, so if, if I'm, just correct me if I'm wrong, Vivian, but uh, Karen, I think if you're going to invoice the client, then regardless of the contractor saying go ahead, you need to get, uh, you need to get a confirmation directly. Signature from the client? A signature or an email confirmation saying that, uh, you know, is that, is that correct? Yes, that's right. Or if it's going to be the contractor, then I would be invoicing the contractor. Yeah. yeah. But sounds, no, that makes sense. Yeah, it sounds like though you don't invoice the contractor in you know in most cases, Vivian. It's yeah, it's, we invoice the client. Yeah, yeah. So in that case, you need to treat them, you need to go through that process and uh, get the details of the client from the contractor, so you can get in touch with them and say, yeah, this is we've been contacted by such and such. Um, I can see, I can, I can hear Patrick working hard in the background, Karen. That's good. Crack the whip. <laughs> <laughs> That's because he's. He's going away tomorrow. That's any reason. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So it sounds like you need to get those details, the client's details. That's fine. I, and then, I, uh, I need to be more brutal and make sure I get the client's details. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, that makes sense now. Yep. Yeah, great. I'll just mute you, Karen. Great. Excellent. Um, so, yeah, any other questions? Otherwise, what I'll do is just flick over to homework time. There's no point uh, just listening to this and not, uh, you know, not making uh, or not taking action, I suppose, if there are things that you need to do. So if you can grab a piece of paper and just um, have a think about what Vivian's covered. Um, the, you know, just very quickly again, Vivian, it was the T's and C's, like reviewing in terms of conditions, um, so I should have left your presentation up there. Vivian, are you there? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So it's the T's and C's, the credit process, um, making sure you've got credit application 
uh, yeah, the, you cap, you're capturing the right information. Um, director's like guarantee. That. Sorry, Vivian? Director's guarantee. Yep, director's guarantees. Do you want to go through that the rest of your list of things very quickly and just see what people... Yeah, just so, yep. people, so, so people know Jensen. what they need to write down to action. Yep, so um, review your terms and conditions. Um, review your credit check process, um, which is the credit application, um, and your director guarantee. Um, review your system in terms of chasing the debt, whether you get a reminder, sending out... Um, overdue notices, what your process is, um, and then what your process is once the customer hasn't paid, whether you're going to escalate that through to a debt collection agency or avoid. Yeah. Excellent. All right. So um, if, uh, if someone's got some actions out of that, uh, the presentation, if you can just ch um, share that in your chat box, if you feel um, happy to do that, that'd be great. It'd be great to hear. Uh, what types of things people need to do out, out the back of that presentation. And obviously if, um, so Karen just said, thank you, confident knowing the process now, which is great. And I think that's the key. It's, it's, it's really just making sure, um, yeah, that you do, you review your process. It's just good to be able to take the time out and, and listen in and have a think about the process. Um, and as, as Karen's example showed, yeah, everyone's, everyone's business is a little bit different. You know, she's got that unique issue in her business um, and everyone's probably got something a little bit unique in their business that needs, you know, that might need a specific review. Uh, Will's listed a few things, which is great. Um, all good. Any closing remarks from either Vivian or Lucien? I just, I, mute, I muted you before, Lucien. I wasn't sure what that background noise was. But That's okay. I think it was uh, Patrick working away. <laughs> no, um, no real question. I, I think it's knowing, uh, uh, you know, definitely having the processes and everything in place. I think it's really important. But also knowing, I mean, from our perspective, is knowing we can refer someone that we trust to to help you guys out as well. So um, yeah. I know we've referred a fair bit of work to Vivian, you know, with clients and stuff like that. So. Yeah, and um, Vivian's always, and it's quite, and I suppose it's about being practical and commercial about things as well. Um, I know from experience, uh, Vivian's the first to tell clients, you know, if it may or may not be worthwhile uh, pursuing a matter, whether it's debt collection matter or any any type of legal matter. Um, sometimes it's, uh, you know, you need, to, you need a, a solicitor, a lawyer that can look at that commercial um yeah, look at it commercially and, and whether things are worthwhile. Yeah. Yeah. Vivian, any any comments there before we wrap up? Um no. No? Um, all good. Yeah. All good. Well, I'd like to thank Vivian and thank everyone else as well for uh, for taking the time out to uh, to listen in and take some notes and have a think about your process. So uh, definitely if you wanna if you have any questions afterwards, if you have a think about things, um, We'll share Vivian's presentation, so all of those points are, uh, so you've got all those bullet points and, uh, and steps in place. Um, so uh, all the best. We'll speak to you all soon. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Vivian. Speak Good soon, on. Vivian. Bye.